So I'm Tanisha. Um, I'm currently an MBA student at London Business School. Prior to the MBA, I had a career in healthcare. And in my final role, I was a data scientist and we were looking at how we could use algorithms across the value chain in pharma. I continue to remain interested in healthcare, especially how uh, you know, different business models are revolutionizing the healthcare industry. And um, in that breath, I'm also the, one of the co-presidents of the healthcare club at LBS. So both personally and on behalf of the healthcare club, I'm really excited to be here having this conversation with you. Um, so Alp is a PhD researcher and he's a PhD candidate in management science and operations at LBS. Alp has been conducting research um, into some of the most pressing challenges that are being faced in emerging markets. And uh, before I continue further, I'll allow Alp to introduce himself and his work really quickly. Hi, thank you, Tanisha. Uh, I'm very excited to be a part of this talk and thank you for, for inviting me. Um, I'm Alp Singh. I'm at my fourth year of my PhD at, at London Business School. Um, and this work is, um, is a joint work with my advisor, Professor Kamalini Ramdas, um, and Ali O at uh, its Management Science and Operations Department in London Business School. I'm, I'm fascinated by this welfare improvement problem of the poor, of the, of the ones who are living in the most underprivileged communities of the world. But I think this is a, this is a slightly broad term. So my particular um, research um, strategy research focuses on, um, in, in, in some sense, combining a business perspective and the perspective of those who are really studying their lives and try to see pathways to improve the efficiency of the goods and services that they are aiming to alleviate poverty. So, um, so far, I've been working on two sort of interrelated areas. One is about the on the, on the problem of information isolation of the poor. The poor are, do not have access to sort of relevant um, uh, access to information and markets. So we're using, we're looking at the problem of mobile phone usage and looking at the data packages that can help them bring them to the market, bring the poor into to the information in a more efficient way, help them navigate in this digital world, which is very recently introduced to them. And my other sort of stream of research, which is the focus today is on the malnutrition problem. And in, in this project, we're looking at the um, use of data analytics in, in very broad terms uh, to help designing nutrition targeted food policies and, and mostly in particular on um, food subsidy programs. That's really interesting. And I think both of those uh, are tackling some of those problems in emerging markets in really different ways. Um, and that's, so thank you for sharing that. But as you mentioned, I think the one that we're gonna speak about further today and you know, personally also really excited to learn about um, is your malnutrition project. So could you speak a little bit more on what exactly is the problem that you are trying to tackle there? Mm -hmm. um, so in, in, on overall, the, I think it's, it's a big term to use malnutrition. So maybe I can decompose it and, and a bit more specific about it. So we're, we're looking at the problem of food subsidy design and we're doing an experiment in India. So what is a food subsidy? A food subsidy is a form of health, is a form of aid. It can be in the form of cash, it can be in the form of vouchers, uh, it can be in the form of food itself. But the main idea is to give some aid, give some help to the poor to make food more affordable. There are a few things uh, about the malnutrition uh, challenge um, in the world that, that we're building on top. So I think one assumption that we should talk about is, is, on, uh, is on the fact that we always think, I was thinking before starting this research, we were thinking malnutrition is a, you know, a mere repercussion of poverty. You know, people simply don't have enough money to afford food. And if this assumption is the only reason that malnutrition persists, then perhaps we shouldn't put too much focus on the malnutrition problem, because if we solve the economic development problem, malnutrition problem will automatically be resolved. But this has not been the case, and it's, it's called uh, a very interesting phenomenon called South Asian enigma. It is on child health. Um, and what, what researchers have been shown is taking Africa as a benchmark, in the last 50 years, South Asia economies is rapidly improving. But this comparatively improvement, economic improvement, had not equally translated itself into nutritional outcomes. So in other words, in some sense, to some degree, there are some people who are getting richer, but not equally healthier. And 
how we're trying to address this problem again is through food subsidies, through making an economic incentives, through making the food more affordable. And I, I think this sort of gives us the, the idea that besides the economic near uh, affordability problem, there might also be something about the inherent nature of the shopping dynamics in the, in the slum markets, in the, in, the, in the poorer community that might be amplifying this malnutrition problem. Malnutrition is a big term. It's a, it's an umbrella term, then it's a very asymmetric problem. You know, it's in the form of overnutrition in the United States, it's in the form of calorie intake in Africa. And, and our research is, is particularly designed for South Asian countries. And the nutrition challenge here is a, a very interesting one. Unlike Africa, it is not a caloric intake problem. It is called hidden hunger. And what hidden hunger means is people do eat enough. It's not a calorie intake problem again, but it is it is a lack of certain essential vitamins and minerals. So I think in lay terms, it is not that people eat less, but some people eat wrong. So this is a, this is a particularly difficult challenge because you know, it's very hard to identify. When you, I think when you imagine malnutrition, you, you think about a kid that is, you, know, you can see its bones and it's very thin, but this is not how malnutrition looks in South Asian countries. You would see the body fat. And, our, our research is, is try to you know, combine these two factors because you know, if, if the problem is not on the caloric intake, but it's sort of on the dietary diversity, then it might be difficult to identify which products we should subsidize. Because you know, um, maybe I can give an example. Like if you want to increase calcium intake, one idea would say, hey, you know what? You should increase milk because it's full of calcium. But I think in, in these environments, it, it, you might be a little bit more careful because if you, increase, if you make milk more attractive, you might see people consuming less of cheese, less of yogurt. So, and this is a particular problem if you want to increase the dietary diversity. And this very problem is, is what we're asking for. We're trying to understand the shopping behavior, the grocery shopping behavior of the, on the food choices in these impoverished communities. And we try to de design an algorithm that answers a very simple question, which products we should subsidize and by how much we should discount in order to more, most efficiently and effectively improve nutrition in these communities. That's really interesting. I think these are some of the terms that I hadn't heard associated with malnutrition before. And you're absolutely right. When you, when you think about malnutrition, for me personally, I just think of lack of access to food. And not, you know, this as you mentioned, the South Asian enigma, which is the wrong kind of food, or you know, the nutritional diversity that you're talking about. So when you say that um, you're trying to, you know, identify and optimize the kind of subsidies that you um, offer to these impoverished communities to change some of those behaviors um, when they do grocery shopping, I think you know that's a very interesting and very intricate problem to be solving. So. Could you, could you talk more about how exactly your research is looking at this problem? You know, we're all living in the environment, I think in, in the ages where, I, I think we all have this experience. You know, you talk with your friend, you say you're interested in, you know, buying some, some shoes. And in the very next day, you open up your Instagram and then you see the very same advertisement saying, ah, here, here are some shoes. Uh, so, I mean, hoping no, none of our apps are listening to us, how they do this? You know, what opens the store is, is data analytics. You know, these, these companies, these big, big, uh, you know, Amazon, Instagram, all these uh, online advertisement companies collect some uh, very detailed data, know a lot of information about their customers, and then has very, very powerful algorithms that help them identify what would people be interested in. In, in, in a conceptual level, this is what we're after. This is what we, uh, how we try to do. Um, we try to use data analytics, not in the very same algorithms, but in a similar fashion that we try to understand the consumption patterns. We try to understand the elasticities, price elasticity, how you would react to price changes. So we, we develop a model that answers the question of, you know, simulates the answer of, if I change one product's price by one unit, what happens to my overall shopping basket? It's not that the, I'm not interested only in the product that I'm changing the price that I'm subsidizing. I'm interested in the overall shopping basket. We, we try to use the same tricks, same algorithms um, on a completely different problem that is, you know, ha has a lot of different challenges. So 
uh, we want to give some you know, analytic driven insights into this um, malnutrition and food subsidy design problem. I think the challenges here is twofold, right? One is you're working with a group, with a population that is not as you know, in touch with the technology. You, you can't actually get that data and that feedback really quickly the way you can in some of these other examples that you shared. But it's also a completely different you know, economic policy kind of environment, given that it's an emerging market um, and it's an impoverished community within that. So I'd be really interested to hear what some of the challenges you might have faced um, when you're conducting your research and you know, whether you had the opportunity to actually be on the ground in person and experience that. I think you're absolutely right. Like um, this is what one sort of thing that we would really try to understand. You know, the shopping dynamics might be very different for various reasons. Usually when we think about from a, at least an uh, analytic sense, we think about like fridge filling shopping trips. Uh, people go to store, buy some items, but the dynamics itself might be, shopping dynamics itself in these areas might be very different. You know, people are massively liquidity constrained. A lot of people are on daily wage workers. Uh, the stores are much smaller. So I think from our pilot studies, what I can say, uh, and this might be a bit more generic, but I think doing a field research in the ground, at least in my experience in a slum community in India, um, trust is a major barrier. You know, it's not only you go and you ask people questions, uh, you also need to establish local connections, uh, network with the local stakeholders. Uh, and, you know, these people are very humble. They are working very long hours in very physically intensive jobs. And they're still, you know, sharing some of their times to, you know, uh, help us do our research. Perhaps I can share like one other thing that I personally experienced, you know, uh, you know, I told you that my previous research is on smartphone usage, and you can think about it as a luxury. You know, if you have malnutrition, if you have tuberculosis, it's a luxury. And I, I spent about like five months in, in a slum community in Mumbai. And, you know, during these five months, I was interacting with people on a day-to-day -day basis. And I almost never met someone that doesn't own or that doesn't share a mobile device. But what is, what is more interesting is I met a lot of people who were like lost their loud lung or who were suffering, suffering from diseases like tuberculosis or you know, diarrhea or all malnutrition. So, um, so I, I think it's an important question to have. Why? Why they are, in some sense, people are sacrificing from their essential needs and investing in something else. It's not necessarily smartphones. It could be weddings. It could be funerals. It could be completely something different. You know, there are, there are pioneering works um, uh, by Esther Duflo and Abhijit Banerjee, uh, the 2019 Nobel Economics laureates. They were working on the iron deficiency problem. And they were looking at not only changes the, the type of food that people eat, but they were changing the technology behind it. They are making the salt iron fortified to help, um, I think, tackle the anemia problem. And uh, it, it, they say, the, the paper suggests it's very, very difficult to change habits. Even if you give this iron fortified salt to people for free, people are not going to consume it. So I think this is one of the, uh, the, the challenges and uh, we don't have an immediate answer for it, um, that changing habits is very difficult. But we, we put a very special emphasis on this uh, because that's how we, we try to, to model like not change anything that people consume keeping the store shelf, not changing the store shelf, but try to do some price-based incentive in order to switch from something that they are used to into something else that they're used to. I think the, the nuances and the intricacies of this are very interesting because as you said, when you think of calcium and you think of where kids get their calcium from, you think milk and you think that would be the easiest way to kind of, you know, put that in their uh, shopping baskets. Um, but I think that's that's really interesting. And I think you said, you know, you're trying to address some of these problems, address some of these challenges. And I'm just curious to know if there is, you know, an end goal that you are trying to achieve um, from this research, from this project that you'd like to see, um, you know, both maybe personally and for the research itself. We're, our, our goal in, in this research is to help contributing to this area of improving nutrition. And there is a whole body of work on this. Uh, it's not only governments, usually governments do these subsidies, but um, there are a lot of entities like non-governmental organizations, intergovernmental organizations, um, like United Nations and, and World Food Program, in fact, is doing some of those uh, subsidy, days, uh, subsidy type food days. 
I, I think what, what our algorithm does is in, in sort of simple terms is that um, give me your budget per person, how much you want to spend for one of your um, below poverty line citizens and tell me about your nutrition problem. Like what is the thing that you want to improve? Is it calcium, is it protein, is it, um, is it calorie? And then my algorithm will try to give you based on our shopping behavior model, based on our understanding about the dynamics of the shopping model. My algorithm will say, oh, if you have $5 that you want to allocate, it will say, oh, reduce the price of meat by $2, reduce the milk price by $1 and, and reduce the chicken or almonds by, by $2. And based on my shopping model, based on our understanding about this, these consumption patterns, this portfolio of discounts should be the one, at least to our model, should be the one that most effectively um, or, or like optimizes uh, for your nutritional goals. So this is sort of our, our, our end goal is to create a decision support tool that helps policy providers using these environments. So I think, um, you know, when you talk about optimization, when you talk about the, the people and the policymakers, I would imagine that if not malnutrition, if not only malnutrition, then there are other problems as well, you know, either in India or in other kind of developing markets, emerging markets where your, your algorithm, your optimization could be you know, applied and be really useful. What was your personal motivation and inspiration to actually pursue this research and this challenge? Perhaps I can share one of like the first things that I that I experienced. Um, again, as I told you, like I was doing some work in, in, in smartphones and this was a field experiment. So I spent like this uh, some time in, in these environments. And it was with my advisor, Kamidini, we were um, exploring the area, we were talking with people. And I, I never forget, there was this one lady, she was barely in her 20s. Um, and she has a kid, you know, very young, age two, five, um, very young kid. And she lost his husband. So, I mean, just by talking to her, you can definitely understand she is in need for external help. At some point, the discussion came about like her kid and what she does with, uh, you know, feeding her kid. And she said very, very proudly, she was telling us, no, I feed my kid with milk every day. And, you know, we were, we were perplexed. You know, it's, it's very unlikely to see people feeding their kids with milk every day. Um, it's, it's, it's not a cheap product. And she was particularly, even within the community, is on the side of more underprivileged ones. So we asked her, like, how? And, like, what, what, what she does for it? And she told us her trick. Um, she said, um, you know, I pour water. In, in my kids' milk. And you know, it is, it is if you think about it, it's, it's, very, it's, it's a very powerful statement because it's not only an idle practice. It's not that she's not improving uh, her kids' calcium intake. This area is called the dumpster flop. So the whole settlement is built, built on top and next to a dumpster area. There is no proper water supply system. So people keep their water in, in big barrels, often not even covering them. And because of that dumpster, the water is full of bacteria and microbes. So this area, the, in, in this area, like the disease like tuberculosis and diarrhea and, and is very prevalent. So without knowing, she was pouring external microbes and bacteria without improving the calcium in, in, uh, content of her kids' milk. And you know, you, you go back home and then you try to read something about it. And then you see like every kid dying under age five is dying because of malnutrition. And diarrhea plays a big role in it. And I think after, after reading that, I, I started thinking like, I want to do something about it. That, like that's sort of a personal motivation. Uh, and I think another thing that sort of related to this is, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a leading cause of death. And, but you know, it, it's very different. It's not like cancer or stroke, it's a curable disease. You know, for cancer and stroke, how we try to solve it, these are big problems. You need to invest billions and billions of dollars in, in research and development and billions of billions of researchers, hours and efforts to find the cure for the cancer. But malnutrition is a different one. And you need to do something, some changes in the, in the structural level that sort of helps preventing happening. So it is not that only doctors or medical professions should address this biological or medical problem. But there are also things that businesses or, or policy providers can and should do to help improving 
um, this challenge. So this, I think, is um, is one reason that I'm I was very you know motivated to to do this. And um, as as business coming from business background, I think we're the ones who study and who's very interested in understanding their consumers' uh, dynamics, their, their shopping behavior. So uh, we're, we're very motivated to you know bring some insights from what we know into this area where this sort of questions are, are less of a concern, at least from the policy provider side. And so I think, you, you know, I think we have covered the entire breadth of your research and I've learned so much about malnutrition and emerging markets and some of those habits in those economies. So thank you so much for sharing that. And it was such a pleasure to speak to you today. Uh, it's great to be a part of this conversation. I also enjoy very much. Thank you. Thanks, Tanisha.